All right, we're live. Hey, Professor Mokwa. Yes, sir. Um, we decided to be super creative and do something unique, and I'm pretty sure no one else is going to do this, so we decided to do a podcast together. Yeah, basically a video podcast now. Yeah. I think that's what's going to happen here. So. And talk about basically the chapters and then sometimes reference it back to some articles that we found that were similar to stuff that we learned at each chapter. Um, first, we're going to start off by our experiences in sports and why we like sports. So, Kevin? Okay. So, uh, the discussion board we had to do was the best damn experience. The The two uh, areas I focused on was actually a Bucks game and NASCAR race and how they were so different. And the main thing was the fact that I think my age played a different factor in how I enjoyed it. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to the Brickyard 400 and thought it was the coolest event. Seats were packed. Um, place was filled with people. And, and the race was just so much excitement around the race. It was a pageant almost. And um, you felt like you had to be there. Otherwise, you were missing out on something. And now... Uh, I actually went back two years later, or two years ago, to the uh, one in 2013, and that seats were empty. Nobody was there. My parent. It was hot. It was. It was completely different from from. Um, I'm gonna take my glasses off. Actually, you can't see me. It was a completely different experience, and it was. A, I didn't. I was just. A, uh, it was a blah experience, and I thought. Was it age or was it the product? I I thought it. The special specialness of of the race had worn off to me. I think it wasn't as cool as uh, I was when I, when I was eight. So I think that played a part in, in why I thought it was a worse event than um, the one I did ten years what nineteen ninety eight. So that would have been how old was that? Eighteen years ago? Yeah, eighteen years wow. ago. Uh, it was a completely different experience, but it was the same event. So I, I thought that was fascinating. We'll see it. Mine was, I did mine on soccer, of course. Yeah. Um, that's given. A lot of soccer in this presentation. A lot so from you know. me, um, given. But it was about my experience that I went to go see the U.S. and Mexico play against each other in Mexico. And then versus an USL game that I watched here. And even an MLS game I watched here. And it was just completely different atmosphere. I mean, in Mexico, you couldn't even hear um, anyone. And then obviously when Mexico won like they always do against the U.S. Um, uh, they, like, beer was being thrown everywhere, and it was, like, the greatest atmosphere. You had Vuvuzelas going off the yeah. charts. Um, and when I came to watch an MLS game here, it was just completely different. It was FC Dallas, don't remember, against two. And it was just, it was empty. They had no fan experience whatsoever. The fans were not engaged. And it was just completely, like, Whack. That's that's funny. It's the same thing. I mean, it was the atmosphere. That's kind of what it comes down to, right? Yeah. I mean, my my event was there was a the place was packed. You couldn't find a spot, mm -hmm. and then eighteen years later, it's empty. Yeah, it kind of ruins you. Like, yeah, it's just whatever. It's the same game, same. just yeah, different atmosphere, which changes literally all changes every right? perspective you have on that specific game. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to our, what, our second our second class period was the evolution and transformation of sports business. Yeah, so I we found an article that referenced back to this, and it's an article about Texas high school football, and it's about how companies are investing money in high school programs. And basically what this art article talks about is how um, these uh, – these, um, sorry, sponsors yeah. are investing millions of dollars. Like some five schools in Frisco, Texas made five-year deals with Nike that are coming out to be $1.7 million in high school programs. and For, for apparel, right? So yeah, apparel. To make their jerseys. Yeah, like and um, some districts in Texas are expected to make $230,000 in stadium sponsorship deals alone. So it's... What we were talking about yeah. is just the the change from it being professional to collegiate to now it's going all the way down to high school and who knows where else it, it will Yeah, go. right. I mean, the, even the Olympics and then AAU, all that stuff is now so commercialized. I can't believe high school sports. That was 
Lucy said that I was like, I can't believe high school sports is getting in on that action. It makes sense. I mean, they, school districts, they're not making money. They're not, I mean, they're not funding, uh, getting the funding from wherever, the local or federal government. So they have to find a way to fund their sports. I mean, yeah, and it's crazy though. It's crazy to think. And me coming from Texas, I mean, I know how big football was in my small yeah. town. And then I moved to a city a little bit bigger and they were state champs two years in a row. And I never once would think, hey, they're going to get probably sponsored yeah. by Nike and get millions of dollars. Right. Um, so to think, I mean, football is pretty big in Texas um, in high school and obviously in college, but I would, I never would have thought that. Think about all the activation and all the, basically it's uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. So you can start out basically what teams do at the professional level. They yeah. can do, I don't know, they can do it, they can do it at the high school level. I mean, the, the field, the naming of the, you said the dome. The dome's called Ford Center. For like Ford, Ford Motor uh, Company. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so that's right there. It's brand, you know, activation at, a, at the local level mm -hmm. trying to help there so now it's almost like a family like hey ford's sponsoring the dome they're um you're trying to help out their yeah. family you're trying to help out the kid trying to get the to play sports so it's like oh hey come, come by ford yeah. you know it's like that that's all it all can be uncharted opportunities there i don't think it's a good idea i think it's kind <laughs> of a i think it's just stay separate from high school sports keep it all about right. the, the development but um it's going to be fascinating to see if Adidas starts doing this because right now it's just Nike yeah. and Ford in Texas. And so it's going to be crazy to, to think that other. I wonder what the implications companies. are on like the recruiting of, so like a sponsor, so Adidas is a sponsor here. Right. Can they go and sponsor a high school and kind of have that connection between the, the, the ASU program right. and another Adidas program in the country and then also the biggest tech, the biggest football uh, powerhouse in the, in the mm -hmm. country. Huh, okay. It's changing. Yeah. Big time. And so then the next thing um, that we learned in class was the bit like learning about business models, um, which Kevin's going to talk yeah, about. Yeah. So we, we, so we obviously worked on the NCAA business model together and we were going to take, talk about our takeaways from, from what we learned and, um, kind of how we, we had discussion before here that just talking about how how crazy it is that there's one event that makes up 95% of their revenue. I mean, we hit it on in our presentation, but just the, the everybody that touches involved in the Mar in March Madness, it's mm -hmm. from the sponsors, they, you know, AT&T, Capital One, uh, Powerade, those three big ones, but also CBS, uh, TNT, T Turner, who are broadcasting and are trying to find ways to cover all the games, now with online streaming and all that mm -hmm. stuff, but finding ways to, to get it to the people. Uh, the NCAA itself, to make, they make however much money they made. I don't know. If, I can't remember off the top of my head. But, yeah, um, a lot. Just to think, I mean, we were talking, just to think about what, what would happen if basketball just stopped, if it, if it if it stopped making money yeah. for, for them. I mean, how many companies and how many stakeholders would be involved and um, where would we go? I don't know. Uh, yeah, and when I was doing this project, I was just seeing the amount of money being made by March Madness um, and even some, and the money that the schools were yeah. gaining from this and yeah. just thinking like, if ASU was just in the first round, of March Madness, um, it would be awesome, and to think that our school would benefit from it um, even more. It just it, it amazes me just how much goes into March Madness um, and how yeah. how the hype is real. The hype is real. What do you what do you think would happen? So if, say so the NCAA changes their model, they have to start paying college athletes or whatever you whatever. So March Madness goes away, or what 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 happens to it? Because I, I don't know. I mean, I think it'll be it'll it'll alter. I think the schools that can only afford to pay their, you know, the Power Five might be the only yeah. schools that are competing in, in March Madness now, with, which which hurts the the small schools that 
kind of make their make their claim yeah. during March. I mean, we we played on we played in NCAA um, colleges, so we never really thought about how just just how much goes into the NCAA, how they get their revenue and stuff. So when yeah. we found out that ninety five percent of their money is gained through March Madness. I just couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I thought most of it was yeah. gained through bowls and other championships. Right. I thought football was basically the centerpiece. But and they don't touch it. I say it's all run by the conference. Right. From my my perspective, from a Division three level, I see the academic aspect of the NCA. We don't have. It's not commercialized as much as it is in here at ASU mm -hmm. or, or here in Division one. That it's it's more about trying to give opportunities to, to kids to, to continue their high school prowess, I guess, in, in sports, but at a lower level, at a but still competing. I mean, I, I still I still spent seventy five percent of my day related to football yeah. activities. So I mean, that the real is the time demands, the the commitments, the structure, all that stuff is still there at the lower level. But I mean, the NCA still is affected. That, that aspect of it versus I mean, you go D1. through yeah it's the same thing it's just you're out of I would say though yeah it's I mean academics is their focal point but it's more it's more of a business yeah D1. it really has turned into a business from yeah. just from the influx of money I think it I blame us I blame like the fans it's like if nobody nobody wanted to watch a kid play no one yeah. you know it wouldn't be worthy it would be it would be okay everyone would, participate and play and um, there wouldn't be any money aspect to it. It'd just be strictly playing. Strictly for the academic or the athletic yeah. opportunity. But because there's Texas Texas makes 121 million for football, there's there's um, it becomes a business. It becomes mm -hmm. a complete you know complete revenue generation idea now. So so next class we talk more about business models, right? Mm -hmm. So we got more and I want to switch from the NCA to NASCAR. I know it was one of the project that was covered um, in one of the presentations, but with the new entitlement sponsor of Monster just came out last week. I read an article um, just talking about that development and how that took place. We can almost talk about that for the rest of the pro of the show, basically through the strategies, decision making. All of that could become talked mm -hmm. about from the NASCAR example, but um, from a business model perspective, it's, it's, I don't think it was hit on enough, the fact that they're completely changing. They're completely overhauled their entire business model from not only the way owners, uh, team owners make revenue, that added re that revenue source from their um, charter program, but the fact that Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, um, retired the last two years, so there's those guys were huge, very popular uh, people in the sport. It's almost like if Tiger Woods didn't play in tournaments anymore, yeah. for, and we'll actually hit on golf later. But um, so they they're trying to redevelop or redefine who they are, and trying to right now. I, I said this to Lucy earlier. It's their demographic is white male from the southeast, right? It's that small of a demographic. And they have to try to expand, and if they're still their successful business, it's you know it's a five, it's a, I mean, a family owned, but they make a ton of money through broadcasting, through t uh, tracks, um, sponsors is kind of the name of the game. You have to stick stick a sponsor and everything, right? But they need to attract people like me uh, or people younger than me, and Monster Energy does that. I think the activation with the X Games. It's right there, this head sponsor mm -hmm. um, and even that just that youthfulness of the of the product can shift people. I mean, they can they can have that activation, they can have that brand awareness that from a NASCAR's perspective to go to Monster and say, Hey, people who drink Monster, NASCAR is cool to watch. Mm -hmm. I think it's usually it's all kind of opposite where it's a company is trying to get to the sport or to the team to then get their awareness out. I think NASCAR is at a point where they're, they're trying to break ground in a different demogra uh, demographic, which Monster can help with. And I think, uh, 
So in the business model play chain, from the business model perspective, they have completely focused on the millennial uh, demographic, to, and they're trying to change so the their business models. This now they're trying to shift it a little bit to, to go after these new fans who then can become old fans for over a 30 year period, which contain sustained success for viewership, for people coming to the game, for coming to races and stuff like that. So um, I don't know if you have anything else on I'm NASCAR, saying, but I don't really know much about NASCAR, yeah. but strategy wise, I think it's good that they're expanding their horizons and mm -hmm. trying to find a way to hit the millennials and right. touch them in a certain way. And obviously we're the generation that's always on the go. And so monster being tied in, you need an energy drink. Totally. And so I think it's just, it's going to be um, interesting to see where that takes NASCAR. And it's to contradict or to compare reverse Major League Baseball, their right. demographic, and you don't see that same shift. Yeah. It's not a, see NASCAR's acknowledge that, hey, we need to change. To, to remain competitive and where major league baseball wouldn't say they do i think they're they're like we're good we're, we're okay we're, we're going to try to get the the kids of the parents that's how baseball's going to grow but i think i don't think they do enough to personally i don't think they do enough to market their best players like a mike trout i don't, I don't see him all year and that's a problem but um I think with Monster, with NASCAR, I think they're gonna they're gonna see a lot of the, the top drivers in spot in um, ads and and in in our face to try to get to know them, but also try to connect Monster with play, with the driver. So I think it's a good move. I think it's a smart move for for a company that is trying to get to that next level. And um, we'll see where it goes from here. Yeah, and then to tie on to strategy plus. Um, we're, he's going to talk about type A um, oh, right. organization. I will talk about a type E organization that we learned in class. So he's going to take it away with the type A. Okay. So I thought, I guess we, I kind of use Major League Baseball as an example just now of them having a plan and then sticking to it. But I thought more so the NFL. Um, they, their goal is to make $20 billion a year by, I believe, twenty the next five years. That's what Roger Goodell said in his press conference, I believe two Super Bowls ago. And uh, they have a plan and they're sticking to it. They want to grow in uh, London. They want to um, get the player and get their fan experience gain, but they don't. But I feel like in that plan, the downfall of that is the fact that they are completely in the tunnel tunnel vision when it comes to stuff that hits them on the fly. They can't adjust quickly. So, for example, the viewership is down. They are staying the course. They're saying, hey, it's because of the Trump election. It's because of Major League Baseball with the Cubs being in the World Series. But they're not They're not changing. They're not uh, going to say, well, hey, this is different. This is worse. The product's worse. We have to correct it. That might be good, but it also I think hurts them in the fact that they're they're they don't want to accept. I mean, this isn't the well. I thought it was a th their ideas of sticking so finding a plan and good and sticking with it. That's type. I feel like that was type A, and from what we talked about in class, and. Aspect they can't they don't have that ability to to look at a problem facing them and say okay let's 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 try to attack it well it's more of a well how does that fit in our business plan you know, let's move on go somewhere you know we'll deal with you know we'll forget about it it's not part of our problem we'll go on with it I think that's a pro it's a bad way to look at things so. yeah and then type E I decided it was going to be what is now Phoenix Rising. It's the semi-pro team here that's in the USL for soccer. And they went from being Phoenix FC, which were the Wolves, to Arizona United, um, to now Phoenix Rising. 
So for a long time, they How been, long was that period? Like, no, like seven. Seven, okay, seven, wow. Seven, yeah. Like since I've been here, they when I got here to Arizona, it was 2011, and they started a team in 2012. Since 2012 to now, they've changed their name so three four years. times. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, they've changed coaching staff. They changed management. They've changed ownership. So, need for a soccer team here that the public wants to to be engaged in, but there's not a there's not a plan. There's it's everywhere. Like they're constantly always changing locations. They went from Tempe and um, using our stadium to Scottsdale, to Peoria, and now back in Scottsdale. Um, so for the fans, for them to engage the fans, they need a set organization. They need to have a, one set owner that sticks to this plan and management who helps incorporate the plan and letting the fans know, like, we're here to stay. This is our plan, and we're going to go through it and not yeah. just back out when they see something not going right. And um, so, so it's almost like too much – too much going on. The too much of that thing. Fans don't want to be changing locations. They don't have loyal fans because of that same reason. Because it's like, what what's going to happen next? Like, are yeah. they going to just fold? What's going to happen? Like, there was a point where they weren't playing their. It's like, no one knows what's going on, and sure. they don't want to invest their time in something. Dick. So, yeah. for them to engage their fans and get loyal fans, they need to stay with the plan and just show them that they're here to stay. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite spectrum, I think. Complete. So I think, so type B is, is more of a go with the, look at a problem and be able to not, not have to be so structured, yeah. right? So it's almost like them, they are too much of that. Too much. Too much to where they need, almost need a structure to say, mm -hmm. well, here's how we, we we're making decisions and here's how we, Here's how we're going to do this moving forward. It's almost like listening to too many people or and something. I did an internship with them over the summer, and it was chaotic. They knew what they needed to do on game day, and yet they had nothing organized for that. So it was kind of like, hey, last-minute things. Can we find ball girls? Can we find walkout kids the last minute, like on game day? So it's it's literally like structure is just everywhere, and they never have anything planned or organized. Okay. Next is uh, the, the decision making. Okay. okay. So the next one we're going to talk about is the slide, which was strategic decision making. And we found an article that's kind of perfect for this. It's um, about Toyota and how they backed out for the 2017 uh, commercials. So they didn't put a bid in for the commercial. For the Super Bowl. Super Bowl commercials, yeah. right. So how much is each commercial? So we, we did a little research and saw that commercials cost about $5 million for 30 seconds. And it's, it seems like it gets, keeps getting larger and larger. Mm -hmm. So so Toyota decided not to do it for 2017 because they're already launching two products um, in other places. And they said it just wasn't in the plans for 2017. 2017, but it's not like they're not looking to do stuff with the NFL. They're yeah. just not showing for the Super Bowl. Sure. And the way I saw it was to spend all that money when they already own Mercedes and they're already making all this money. I don't think right. it's this huge investment where they need that commercial to be to to get brand exposure because right. their brand is already exposed enough as a luxury and as the off-roading cars um yeah so no we wanna... well uh, yeah to your point with the two brand uh naming rights to stay in atlanta's new stadium and new orleans mm -hmm. superdome i think it's the mercedes-benz superdome yeah so it, and we were talking and it was i think it's going to hit a peak on on spending i think five companies are realizing more and more that they can do viral marketing they can go on Twitter and show their Super Bowl clip before it even is Super Bowl. Yeah. And they can lead it up to the week. You know, they can have a whole, almost a whole week of, of commercials that is almost more effective and more uh, and less expensive from a, a buy buying or buy in standpoint. That yeah. the the need to buy ad space on Super Bowl Sunday is growing less and less. 
Uh, but Lucy, you had a good point. Uh, yeah, the point I made was that most people, some people, watch the Super Bowl specifically for the commercials. Right. They love to see what what cool, creative things companies made up with this time of year. And I saw it as, is Toyota missing out on those fans that usually wouldn't see a Super Bowl commercial or a Mercedes-Benz or Toyota commercial, but then could because they're watching the right. Super Bowl? Right. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, but I, I feel like there is enough. I mean, I feel like I'll, on YouTube the next day they're all posted, right? Yeah. So I mean, and it's, the big thing is you're, you're, you want to go to work the next day and say, hey, did you, did you see that commercial, right? Yeah. I think you can do that at work the next day. If you're like, oh, I didn't see any, but you can just quit. Right. So I, I think the lure of this one day a year, it's the biggest TV day, TV day of the year for definitely Americans, but like there's other ways. We're going to see it in technology, um, streaming, all that stuff. There's also other ways to market Mm -hmm. Not directly on television. So, um, moving to issues, issue management. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the well, one issue management that we need to talk about is NFL ratings. Okay. Yeah. So we found an article that was NFL ratings were declining. Well, declined this year, and the article is talking about possibly it being because of the elections going on and. Trump's all over the news. Um, Hyundai is one sponsor of the NFL, and they're looking at this, not seeing it as urgent yet. While as in Nissan, invest their money and other than the NFL, um, because they feel that the decline is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. Yeah. And so I don't know what you think about it. Well, yeah, I think. Oh, we're talking about the the failure to change and failure having to have a structure to to make decisions earlier. I think that I think the NFL is doesn't want to admit that their product's not very good. I don't think, and I think that's the first problem in not being able to fix it. Um, I mean, we saw Monday night the Colts versus the Jets was one of the worst viewership nights of the of the year, and nothing else was going on during the time that the game was on. So um, it's just. The two teams weren't very good, and then the product isn't very good. So it's it's. I feel that uh, how you your your issue it starts with your culture, right? So I feel like the NFL kind of has a culture of we're we're not vulnerable to anything. We're we're impenetrable. This is mm -hmm. the too big to fail, basically for for a, a sports organization, but. That's usually that that arrogance or the um, carry trickles down throughout the whole organization to where nobody. It's almost like groupthink at that point, where everybody's thinking the same thing, and decisions are poor decisions are being made. So I think yes, the NFL still makes the most money out of yeah. any sport and still gets to the highest viewership. But I think that won't be the case in five, ten years. So I think, and I think it starts right now, and it starts from the organizational standpoint that looking at an issue like like play, uh, quality of play, and how do they attack it starts with their culture yep. of how do, how, how do they change? How do they make decisions? Well, you have, an, you have a commissioner, I'll probably, a little too opinionated here, but commissioner who tries to find ways to blame others. It doesn't really take, the, the league itself doesn't really take accountability for things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that shows in viewership. I think that also plays in viewership, but also, Kind of shows how they, they, they make decisions and, and deal with issues. And it goes back to his type A, to just strictly focus on making twenty million dollars. Twenty billion. Billion dollars yeah. that they're not. Really have to take precautions now, then deal with this issue when right. it's already too late. And and we we talked in class about the Diamondbacks. Mm -hmm. And how they deal with issues, and how it's always find a way to get something done, or find a way to make somebody happy, and that that translates over to more than just revenue. That translates over to fans, um, in the in the community. It translates to people who provide goodwill to the that can't be measured. But it's like, hey, we we're you know what the Tigers aren't very good. They haven't been very good since like 15 years ago. Yeah. So, but 
yet people still love them. And people are, are still like, will, will show up to their events because they are such community, such invo so involved in the community. They're so readily, happily to help versus the NFL. It's, it's like they blame everybody. They don't take accountability. And I think people look at, hey, you guys are not a very – Probably, I don't know, I don't work for it, but to work for them, but also to watch. I'm not going to give you my money because you don't treat me well. You don't care about my my views or my feelings. Mm -hmm. So you're out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll go to something else. Basketball is out. I'll watch yeah. the NBA. So um, moving on, I think, the leadership. Yeah, it's ish, issue management. Issue management and leadership? Mm -hmm. Okay. So – the leadership aspect, we thought, um, I just read the article or watched the video actually of, of Jack Swarbrick, the, the Notre Dame athletic director of uh, uh, University of Notre Dame athletic director. He, uh, the big issue right now is whether they should have fired Brian Kelly or whether um, to keep him for next year. And he said, and he, I know from working with him and talking with him, Personally, he, he's a guy who is always 10 steps ahead. He's always – and he's not a person who's going to make rash decisions. And I think that that overall thinking trickles down to the rest of the organization. So I was talking with uh, Jill Bodenstein this weekend, and uh, who's the head of compliance, and she was talking about how he's so calm and he, you know, he's so – uh, honest. He's so honest about how, uh, well, here, you know, there's some problems with that with football. There's some problems with here. Yeah. And we were going to bowl games. Now I can. I can I could say, hey, let's do some stuff differently. Let's do, and he knows when to, to push, when to pull. And then I think he's, he's a perfect example. I, I said Mark D'Antonio in class from Michigan State. I think Jack – He's a perfect person to who gives who empowers his staff, who empowers people around him, and um, creates that culture. Like I talked about in the project or in the topic area before, that culture of we're in, we're in this together. We're in, whether we're failing or we're succeeding, we're in this together, and we're going to win as a team or lose as a team, but we're doing it together. And I think that. No matter what the success or the failure rate is, that family, that that uh, sense of culture, that sense of entitlement or empowerment, that will last for generations. That will that will go beyond as an organizational structure that can do good versus an opposite structure. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Your think thoughts on that? I don't know how it's run here. I think you well, can talk about your coaches, your soccer coaches. Yeah, our coaches, all of them got fired. Um, for us, it was more of a, it's crazy to see how much your leader does impact everybody underneath mm -hmm. them. And obviously our girls didn't respect our coach enough. And there was problems within the coaching staff that we could see happening and it affected us tremendously that we had the worst season ever of soccer. And it wasn't because our team wasn't talented enough. It was because the management was just so toxic that we couldn't concentrate on the things that we needed to do. And so that's when they took um, in this and decided to basically force resignation for all of them. And I'm graduating and won't be part of the team anymore, but they brought in someone new who is just strictly business and has coaches that have been with them for five, seven years. So they he's known those coaches and has had them for a long time. So it's kind of a family already in itself. And so for us, it, I, I think it's just crazy, like looking at this section and then looking at my team and seeing mm -hmm. just literally how much management, even if it's in the sport, yeah. um, a team itself, it affects everybody. And if you don't have a leader that can lead, then it's not going to work out. And it won't work out in a business structure either. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, I think you can you can tell when people don't get along with each other. Yeah. You can tell. I mean, it doesn't have to be said expressly. You can just look at well, who's the leader here. Yeah. And as soon as there's as soon as there's a break in leadership, or as soon as there's 
defiance that the leader the that cohesiveness is broken. broken. And you know, it's a locker room atmosphere. It's a working as an employee. Yeah. You can tell right away. It's like if, if the the leader has no authority or a leader, people don't respect the leader. Yeah, and it's chaos. So I think uh, one thing I did want to add to the issue. Ah, never mind. I'll forget. We're, we're already kind of <laughs> going on. So, uh, is there what's the last sponsorships? Yeah. So management sponsorship and sponsorship innovations. Okay. So for revenue um, management sponsorships, oh, yeah. we're going to touch on the Mercedes Benz um, Stadium. That's in Atlanta. In, in Atlanta, right? For and both so Falcons. this stadium was supposed to be nine hundred million dollars, but it surpassed it, and now it's going to be one point. Five billion dollars and they're so confident in investing all this money that they even say it's going to be better than the AT&T Cowboy Stadium in terms of generating all that revenue um, that they put into the stadium and so so the Falcons under they undershot their how much it was going to cost so mm -hmm. they kind of they need more rep they need more money from the right. Mercedes to make up that's what right you're yes okay. and so Basically, what they said in the article was Atlanta has a lot of Fortune 500 companies headquarters in Atlanta, so they feel um, secure that they can get those headquarters and those owners involved with the Atlanta Falcons to make up for the lot, basically that much the extra money. Cost, yes, yeah. that they weren't ready for. That's was that six hundred million dollars? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The naming rights is a huge, huge sponsorship. Of opportunity for, for companies that, mm -hmm. that are trying to break into sports somehow I think I mean you're seeing it with Chase just became a, the sponsor for the Warriors um, the Bucks I think are gonna have a new they're right now sponsor or they're I don't know what you call it it's not sponsored but I guess it is sponsored naming rights I guess it is sponsored yeah. right? they're sponsoring the building I guess yeah. so they're gonna they're BMO Harris um, but I think that's going to change with the new building. They're mm -hmm. going to have a, a bigger sponsor to pay for it. So, I mean, that revenue source is huge. And, you know, I was just thinking how their Mercedes Benz is owned technically by Toyota. Yeah. And so Toyota isn't doing the commercial anymore for that, the Super Bowl. So you're, it makes you think that maybe that other, yeah, it's another piece. Other piece was that they weren't, they didn't think they were going to need that much more money to pay for that stadium, which is, I'm just thinking about okay. that. So you're saying that Maybe. the fact that they have to pay more means that Makes, they, they yeah. shifted from, instead of the commercial go, hey, let's yep. do the naming rights? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're already investing $1.5 billion yeah. in a stadium. Why do you need to go and invest it in? No, it's that's only for 30 point. seconds. It would be fascinating if the Falcons made the Super Bowl that would because you're so you're not spending because it's I'm trying to think so you're you're making the money from them being successful and then you're not putting it into the ads where mm -hmm. they're actually playing. Yep. It's kind of interesting. But um I'm trying to think what else do we want to add? Oh the well I'm talking about the revenue or the sponsorship, but I guess financing. it was more of that project the yeah, the financing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the tech for when we did the project on the University of Texas, and sh and saw how much the football team um, generated in terms of revenue. One last year, twenty fifteen, was one hundred twenty one million, and though there was an article that I read that I wrote about um, that the, they've spent fifty four million dollars on coaching changes for football alone, and the thought was that. It's almost the cost of doing business for Texas, right? I mean, if you're only if you're making 121 million dollars from football alone, and your team has not been very good since 10 years ago, how much more money can you make when it is good? Um, so they haven't found the right guy, but they are just investing all, all a ton of money to try to find the right guy to make that 121 million dollar figure, whatever, however big they want, they can make it. It helps to, to try to generate more revenue. I think that piece plays a part in it. That's mm -hmm. yeah, we're spending fifty four million dollars on <laughs> three different coaches. I mean, that's a, that's asinine how much money they're spending on coaches. But 
if they hit on the right guy, that that end revenue amount is going to be yeah. make up for it in, in in a year. Yeah. So, NUT has donors and mm -hmm. alumni support that they can kind of invest that money in coaches, and they just have a huge fan support. That yeah. it's insane. It's a different level. We talk about in class. It's a whole. It's it's like Texas. I think Texas A&M's in that discussion, mm -hmm. and then like everybody else, maybe even Oregon. I think Oregon was up there for yeah. like 2013, but it's crazy. It's incredible the, the the disadvantage a school like ASU is at mm -hmm. from a revenue standpoint that they can't afford facilities. They have to do find a creative way through the government to, right. to fund fund uh, facilities and revamp the the stuff and mm -hmm. update it and try to get coaches top tier coaches. Versus yep. a, a program like Texas, who has everything, has an unlimited a blank check, basically. Basically. So, the um, last thing we're going to touch on is signage, okay. uh, which was the last thing we talked about in class. And basically, we found an article, and it's not soccer, it's golf. golf. And it's about Tiger Woods and how he just signed a uh, a signage, basically a sponsorship with Monster, and Monster's gonna have their logo on his golf bag. And it kind of goes back to the innovation and like where sports was back in the old days. And I would never think a creative other way than just putting your logo on his bag. And regardless yeah. if he's the last in the league or the first in the league now, he has that name to where people still wanna see him golf mm -hmm. and hit a ball. And so well, I. You said Monster was the. Yeah. So Monster is jumping in on NASCAR and then Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. It's that sponsor particularly is interesting to me. Monster, They're all over the place. Yeah, it's the golf. It's yeah. not a monster. It's it's a country club atmosphere. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like it's a weird partnership. But I feel like Nike was the same way when they went with Tiger in 1997, mm -hmm. whatever, 95. It was a uh, unheard of. You know, why is Nike trying to get into golf? It's not yeah. a. It's apparel, not equipment. And that, now they're out of it, out of equipment. But Monster kind of has the same vibes, like X Games, NASCAR um, vibe. And so they're trying to add add to their repertoire, I guess, trying to expand. Hit different, trying to probably touch a different side of people. Like, yeah. like you said, country club people yeah. or golf. And so they're probably trying to switch their assets to another specific like type of people yeah. that they can hit. Um, almost done. Are we? We can. Uh, <laughs> we can wrap it up. All right, we'll wrap it up. But uh, the one thing I did want to mention was the article I wrote about uh, this talking about the signage on bags. I, I did one on jerseys. How that was an innovation. Um, the fact that that's a new revenue source for for teams and leagues that uh, they can. It's so. That space on the person is the most marketable space anybody can have because that's what everybody's watching. So it's not, you know, we don't see billboards, we don't see the signs in the stadium, but we'll see the player every single play. So I mm -hmm. think that 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 piece of ad space is so so invaluable uh, or so valuable that uh, we'll see those those numbers completely continue to skyrocket for especially the NBA and I think the NFL will see it. Soon, and I don't maybe basically baseball, but they're gonna have to. I think they have to. We talked about in class that that slingshot effect. Everybody, the, the technology is there now to where everybody's gonna have to do it to yeah. compete. So, uh, on that note, thank you, thank so you, much. Professor Mokwa. We'll see you on Sunday. Um, hopefully, you get this and enjoy it. Hopefully, we brought something to the table that you, right. you enjoy. That's something different than reading art. We're not writing. Our, we're not going to write articles. No. Right. We're not writing we articles. Implemented it into. Yeah. So we did a reflection, a class. I enjoyed the class and everything. That this is why I came to school. To the school mm -hmm. was to learn the business aspect of it, not the in addition to the legal. So. Yeah, and then I enjoyed it because it's coming from someone who's been in the industry for a very long time, and so learning and hearing. Um, real life experiences that you've been through. It's kind of fascinating to see what the real world is like and yeah. what it's it's good to know the business side of it. And I for sure learned a lot from your class. Yeah. So thank you. And uh, take care. Hopefully you enjoy it. <laughs>